There you go. Go PS. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should go. Uh, a, a more appropriate introduction than that. Um, Bill uh, has the, uh, the the unique claim to fame. Um, I have. The, the, the drunkest I've ever been in my life was with Bill Piaski when I vomited into his backpack on a Trans Bay bus at 1.10 in the morning. It was actually the lowest moment in my life. I've actually looked at all of the moments in my life and actually some are actually more rock bottom than others. Vomiting into Bill's backpack was actually rock bottom in my life. With that, Bill Piaski. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. Um, everyone, uh, welcome to Joint. My name is Bill Piewski. I am a software engineer here, and I work on the uh, some of the ZFS features that we use, as well as our uh, general integration with all of the storage features in SmartOS, as well as uh, some of our Joint products. So I'll be presenting um, some features of ZFS and how we use them uniquely in SmartOS, and why I think that makes uh, SmartOS a really interesting platform. So um, some of you are sure are familiar with CFS. Who has uh, heard of it, used it? OK, good. So I'll go quickly through this. It's a, a copyright file system originally developed at Sun, shipped with Solaris 10. It has um, many interesting features. It has inline data compression, uh, the ability to snapshot and roll back individual file systems, ZFS send and receive, which allow you to serialize a snapshot and send it to another system, and it has integration with SSDs for read and write acceleration in your storage pool. And we've been using it, we've been running it in production for years. Enterprise grade reliability, it has data integrity features, it has uh, checksums built in line so it verifies the data as ZFS reads it back from the disks. And in terms of SmartOS, I'm going to talk about two main sort of components or entities within ZFS. The ZFS pools as well as ZFS data sets. So ZFS pools, they aggregate all of the disks or SSDs you've allocated for a system into a single storage pool from which data sets are allocated. So unlike other systems that use a partition editor, sort of a volume manager to set up physical partitions and then make those available to the operating system, ZFS manages that relationship for you. And so it is able to do some sort of interesting things with, with sizing, which I'll talk to you, and makes a more flexible dynamic environment for allocating your storage than just having these fixed size partitions. And like I mentioned before, you can uh, mix both spinning disks disk and SSDs. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, the L2 Arc is a level two adaptive replacement cache actually uh, done by Brendan. And that extends the um, the file system buffer cache that's used to cache the reads which are coming back from the disk. And so that can extend the working set size that ZFS can service. You can also have an SSD, a write optimized SSD for a ZIL device, the ZFS intent log, and that absorbs the synchronous write activity, which will allow for much greater write performance. And then next up are ZFS data sets, and these are simply uh, tree of blocks that are allocated from the storage pool, and they're presented either as a file system, so a file interface uh, to the operating system, to the application, or as a volume, so it can present it as a block, a block device. And so, like I mentioned before, these data sets can be uh, flexibly resized, and even the volumes can be thinly provisioned on top of this because of the, the lack of the volume manager and the ability to manage the disks directly. And the ZFS data set is also the point at which you would set specific properties on a data set. So whether it is uh, using compression, whether it is uh, using deduplication, or you know whether it's shared out over NFS or SMB, each data set has its own administrative controls to allow a fine-grained uh, you know, set of features to each application. <coughs> so are there any questions so far? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Oh, question. Uh, you mentioned the data system can be resized, but uh, the pool itself, uh, you can't shrink it, right? That's a good question. You cannot shrink the pool. You can uh, add grow. devices to it. You can only grow it. You cannot shrink it. Right. So how this relates to SmartOS, um, SmartOS has a non-standard 
uh, storage model here with respect to installing the operating system and the system libraries, and that is we don't install it. We instead uh, boot from a USB key, so the entire operating system kernel and system libraries fit in about 200 megabytes, and that's on a compressed image, and that is booted from a USB key, loaded into memory, and then run any, like any normal system. So this, um, we, we've stripped down everything we uh, needed to boot the system, put it in this one image, and we found that this model has a bunch of advantages. It's worked really well. If you have other software that you need, it can be installed um, from the package source, package manager, for our cloud. We don't actually boot from the USB. We sort of we net boot from a central server, but that's um, sort of another thing. We have a um, single CFS pool on a given system for all of the virtual machines for all of the tenants on that one system, and the swap device and the dump device and all of the configuration for that system live on that single pool. So there are some advantages to this model. Instead of having to upgrade your OS, sort of reinstall or make a new partition, install into that partition and swap over, you just reboot. Um, put a new image on your USB key and reboot and you're up and running several minutes later into the new image. In addition, you don't have to use one or two or however many disks for a system pool. All of the disks on the system are available for deploying zones and deploying virtual machines. In this way, you both have um, more spindles, so you have higher <coughs> I.O. performance as well as greater capacity for all of the zones and virtual machines you want to install on SmartOS. In addition, this model where we are um, having all of the applications and such running in zones as opposed to the global zone, it encourages uh, individual zones for each application you want to install. You know, one for Apache, one for your mail server, one for Nginx, one for Postgres. Um, and it's a more, uh, more flexible model having a zone for each application instead of having um, everything installed you know, in a single operating system all contending for the same resources without any resource controls around CPU or around memory or around disk I.O. In addition, if we are booting from the USB key, this uh, discourages customizing or having sort of one-off patches in your system. You, you can't do it because it's read-only, it's on the USB key. And so, again, you want to make an OS change, you put it on your USB, USB key, boot into it, validate it. If it works, then great, you're up and running. If it doesn't work, if there's some problem, roll back to the previous image, and then you're back running seamlessly on the old platform image. And the last advantage of this, it's easy to bring your OS with you. You know, you have your operating system on a USB key, you can bring it, plug it into a system, you don't have to download anything, you don't have to install a CD, it's there, it's easy to run, and it's on your USB key. So I've mentioned a little bit about um, zones and virtual machines. I always wanted to go quickly through this and make sure that this is terminology we're familiar with. A zone is a Solaris feature. It's a lightweight software virtualization container. It uses the same platform as the actual system. So whatever OS and system libraries your smart OS uh, USB key is providing, that's what the zone is going to be running as well. And it's allocated its own ZFS file system. So I'll explain a little more about that on the next slide. A uh, virtual machine is a hardware virtualized container, and then this is using the, the KVM work that Robert and Brian and others have done. And this allows us to uh, hardware virtualize other operating systems, like GNU Linux or Windows or BSD. And this uses the uh, as ZFS volume. So these VMs have a volume that is exposed to them into which they can ex install their own uh, file system, whatever that is. And both a zone and a virtual machine, we call them machines more generally, have resource controls for CPU, memory, and disk I.O. So we're, you know, we're using ZFS for SmartOS. Why is this a good idea? What advantages does this give us? Um, first of all, snapshots. You can snapshot your zone or your virtual machine. Um, you can back it up, you can recover it. It's easy to do, it's easy to serialize the entire state of your application because you're running within ZFS. 
like I mentioned before, there's uh, flexible space management. You can set reservations on a data set to say make sure that you know this there's at least 10 gigs available for this particular data set. You can set a ZFS quota on it, never exceed more than 20 or 50 or however many gigabytes. <coughs> there's also a uh, ZFS feature called delegated administration in which you can delegate the uh, properties and administration of a zone's data set to that zone. So they can do things, and you know, they can set their own properties, they can set the compression level, they can take snapshots of your application data, they can generate send streams of that application data and back it up and recover it, and they can do, they can create child data sets. And this delegated administration allows them to do whatever they want. It sort of allows them, it leverages um, all of the ZFS properties and the, um, the niceness of that for the particular tenant. So just some other um, other bits about ZFS. Obviously, the data integrity is a big part. So um, you know, for SmartOS, we rely on that. But if our, um, we have VM guest file systems that are writing data into ZFS, and they're writing it from ext4, XFS, or NTFS, or any other file system, ZFS is still providing that data integrity from those other file systems. So it's checking it at a lower layer before it hits the disk. Uh, from those other file systems. And then, as usual, there's uh, different storage configurations. There's a um, merit configuration. You can marry your disk. This is for higher performance scenarios. There's RAID Z2, which is a double parity RAID. Um, and, of course, others, you know, uh, RAID, RAID Z1, RAID Z3, and whatever makes sense for a particular system. And all of these configurations are supported on the different, um, all of the storage configurations smarter OS supports, so you can have swap devices, dump devices, and all of the system configuration installed on any kind of storage pool. So just to wrap up here, um, the smart OS ZFS architecture, we netboot from the US VP, and there's no OS install required. We have a single system-wide ZFS pool for all the tenants, and that allows us to have individual controls and administration for the um, for each tenant's file system or volume. Thanks. <coughs> there is no ability to create multiple pools, let's say if you have a system with a different type of disks which you don't want to combine in a single pool or want to make a pool with different, let's say, rate Z and rate 10 type sure. of Performance. Yeah, so the question's about multiple pools, you know, can you do that? And you definitely can do it. And it's something that we don't necessarily recommend because ZFS likes to have control and access to all of the disks for scheduling and performance reasons as well yeah, as... Yeah, it's still ZFS. I mean, right. Like, so you can do that. I think you would have to have a pretty good reason to do it. <coughs> um, and you'd have to think carefully about it. But it's definitely possible if you want to have some zones on a, you know, mirror configuration for performance reasons and so on. Ready to for yeah, you recommend allocate different systems, different hosts. Exactly. All these that's a, of that's a much more common mm -hmm. paradigm where you have some systems using Merit, some using RAID Z, RAID Z2, but each system has a single pool with a single configuration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just curious whether the joint cloud is all in one pool. So each system has its own pool, but the uh, cloud itself is not. Uh, we tried to do it on one system, but it didn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> you actually did? Wait, oh, yeah, why not? We had some problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I might have missed this point. Uh, so where are the settings of uh, smart OS? Where are they stored? You said you mentioned that on USB key, nothing is written there? So the USB key has a configuration file, which has you know the sort of basic information about you know, what network interfaces are going to be plumbed up and what their IP addresses are going to be. And so when you first boot up SmartOS, and then I don't know if, I don't know if I'm sort of getting into your territory here, but the, um, there's a little configurator where you can say like, you know, this is the type of pool I want, these are my IP addresses, this is the root password, and that takes a configuration file and writes it back to the USB key. So that is stored on the USB key with the operating system image. And then when it boots up a second time, it sees the configuration file there 
reads it and is able to load the necessary information. Right. So the way to do it, you install everything you uh, with all your VMs, then you would immediately take out USB key, make a copy of it, and then put it back. Just in case, I mean, I wonder if you, let's it's say, you already created... The, the config file is not that complicated. So, and well, also, you, have like to, the, you have to make a copy yeah. of it, right? Because so USB key can fail. So it's, it's, it's literally like 12 lines. Oh. A, copy, a copy of that configuration is stored on your system Z pool. Yeah, yeah, that's my question. It is stored on the Z pool. In, so in the next talk, we're going to go over. So you're not storing yeah, yeah. any settings in the USB key. So not we're for, not in SmartOS. Just no, never okay. Basic. No, no, never no, no. In SmartOS, there's no configuration on the USB key. There's not. Okay. It is all stored on your system Z pool. Okay. Okay. Yes. And well, it's in both. <laughs> no. Or system. It's, just, it's different. Other questions? Yeah. You said you have a single ZFS pool for all your tenants. So how are you mount managing the quality of service? Do you have a zone for tenants, or how, how are you managing that? Did he pay you to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a very excellent question. I think that I've it's a very excellent question. Um, so we do have a, yes, we have a zone for tenant. Okay. And we have a data set per zone. And we have a facility in the kernel, the ZFS IO throttle, which is which which I which I wrote, <laughs> and that um, that you know biased. tracks <laughs> I'm biased. that tracks how much I/O has been done over some trailing period, and then if one particular zone has exceeded its fair share of I/O, then dis subsequent disk I/Os from that zone are throttled back. Okay. So that's a feature in the kernel that relies on looking at which zone is doing how much I/O, and then. Like you said, each zone, you know, each tenant has its own zone, so it's able to figure out which tenant might be exceeding its fair share. And there's similar controls for memory and CPU as well? Yep, and it's all based on the, the zone binder. Those are sort of properties of the zone. And on the I.O. throttle, the, the interesting observation there was that the, what really destroys multi-tenancy is synchronous writers. Synchronous writers can do a damage to, to, to other tenants on the box that no one else can go do. So, in particular, we throttle those back, and the, 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 the surprising result, I think, when, so Ben from the op side and, and Bill and Jerry Jelinek from the engineering side sat down and, and together went to tackle this problem based on, on the things that, that Ben and co. had seen in production. And the thing that was very interesting was that a very small throttle had a huge impact on, on tenancy and survivability. So, if you throttle those synchronous riders back, and Bill's throttle is adaptive, um, and so Bill and Jerry's throttle is adaptive, and What's very interesting is the numbers it settles on. So it'll throttle the writers back to the point where it's opened up some breathing room on the box. And the interesting thing is the numbers it settles on are astonishingly low. Um, we read Ben had a, Ben, as I recall, he generated a script that, that kind of represented, Postgres was kind of a canonical example of just torturing the box with synchronous writes. So Ben generated kind of a, a, a script that mimicked this behavior. And this thing, we would throttle it back by, we're talking like hundreds of microseconds per write. And that alone was enough for tenancy to spring back and for the other tenants to be able to make forward progress. Um, so it's actually very surprising how effective a, a relatively basic, yeah, sophisticated, sophisticated mechanism. <laughs> um, sure. Sophisticated. Elegant, elegant, actually. I, I'm elegant, I think is what we would say. Um, anyway. Is that due to the context switching for the CPUs being overwhelmed and then just released? It, 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 what it's based on is that, that the uh, when you've got a random reader, uh, you've got a reader that's sitting there. And the, the, in order to do that random read, we, it's going to have to move the head wherever that is, right? So you, you, you've, got a, you've got a head seek, you've got a rotational, a rotational latency, um, and but that reader is not going to do that much damage to the disk. Whereas the, the, the synchronous writer will often just do synchronous writes as fast as it possibly can, and th those synchronous writes, ZFS is a copyright file system, so those synchronous writes are always going to be at one location on the platter, right? Because it, it, it's it's just filling the platter from the outside in, right? So it, so you're almost Guaranteed to thrash if you've got random reads or just reads in the presence of synchronous writes. Um, and just slowing those guys down a little bit gives the readers enough room to be able to get to their random reads in, because the random reads are going to take milliseconds. It's nothing that, that's the physics. But there's a huge difference between milliseconds and getting queued behind all the synchronous writes. I think also that the disk will see those synchronous writes and it will prefer to do those um, because they're all in one location. So the disk, you get kind of QoS from the disk as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, it was a surprising result, actually, at least for me. I was not expecting uh, throttles of such a low value to have such an effect on on, on the, the ability of these random readers to make more progress. Yes. Okay, there are other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, 
how do you how do you handle uh, doing incremental snapshots? Like if you took a snapshot of volume, some things that were changed, can you take it an incremental snapshot or do you have to do a full snapshot? So the question is about taking incremental snapshots and you can definitely do that. And that's uh, specified between a snapshot you've taken in the past and a current one. So the boundary is between any two snapshots on the system. And then ZFS is able to walk the delta between those two snapshots, serialize that into a send stream, and then save that off for future consumption on another system. Another question? Sure. Uh, have you had systems where you have both spinning disks and SSDs on the same system, like say, okay, this, this position, or this, this far, like slash bar needs to be nice and quick, but the rest of it doesn't. Have you combined SSDs? Yes, so we have, um, you know, we have had these hybrid storage pools, we call them, that have both the spinning disks, you know, they're slower, they're lower performing, but they have better capacity with SSDs for read and write acceleration. And each data set is able to indicate whether it is using those SSDs for the, um, for the additional caching or not. So you can indicate at the data set level whether you want to be using the SSDs for the additional read acceleration, or you just want to rely on the slower spinning disk, and that's per data set. Uh, but shouldn't uh, using zeal disks solve the synchronous and random readers problem? Because in this case, you can synchronously write and see. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes it better. Generate. It definitely it improves it a lot. It doesn't yeah. solve it necessarily. So it's it just like makes it not sufficient. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's better. I mean, it's, a, it's, you know, it's lowering your latency and like how fast is fast enough. Like, there's no absolute like, yes, you know, it, the problem is solved. It's just yeah, I'm just wondering that even with zeal disks, you still have the problem. Yeah, we, we, we don't have in the in the JPC. We don't have dedicated zills huh. now. I, 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 this right. Is, this is a kind of a, the, yes. the IO protocol kind of dates from two years ago at this point. Huh. Okay. Um, so yeah, but the, the, you're right that, that a zill, a dedicated zill, a slog with an SSD uh, does ameliorate the problem. But I think it's still you still have this issue that synchronous writers can do mm -hmm. damage to random readers. Okay. And I guess it's a different design point, right? I mean, design problem because with zill you overall improve performance of your pool. But with your throttling, you kind of limit, uh, as I understand, yes. you limit certain users or certain zone clients yep. to, the, to occupy 100% of your... Right, that's exactly right. That's you, a good you, point. you definitely need the two together. Because in a lot of cases, when things get really bad, mm -hmm. no amount of speed up is going to improve, right? Oh, you just scale it up, right? Yeah, I mean, everyone you in this room probably and then see the problem where it's like, I'll oh, just put an SSD in there yeah. and run will go away. And it was better for a little while. And, and then you have 100 and then more you clients, right? Situation. <laughs> yeah, you know, something goes crazy, particularly, I mean, in the cloud, I mean, just like all you guys, right? There are situations where processors, the processes just go nuts. When that's in a client environment, I'm not authorized to just log into their account and, and go and, you know, tweak that job process, right? I can shut them down, but I prefer not to do that. In those cases, I need to keep them running and everyone else still running fair. So no amount of fast is fast enough. Mm -hmm. So you can have all the Zill in there you want. You can put a Fusion I.O. in there as a Zill, right? <laughs> at, at some point, you still need the throttle to keep everything fair at any speed. That's because you're coalescing your writes in the Zill, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But there's just a tad bit how you calculate the throttle in terms of the... Yeah, with the sure. So in terms of calculating the, the basically the utilization of a particular zone, we look at the previous couple seconds and then track how many reads and writes one particular zone has done. And then we assign a, we basically multiply the average of how many IOPS you've done over the past two seconds, multiply that by the observed disk latency for the system, and then calculate that and compare them between two particular zones. So if we have zones that have the same IO priority, which is the setting you can set saying this is an idle priority of 10, this one that might be 20, this one might be 100. If the utilization metrics are out of whack with respect to the priorities, then the zone that has exceeded its utilization, then we throttle that one. Uh, we throttle the subsequent operations from that in the next second or so. so the, part of the key is that when the load comes off the box, the throttles will relax, so that the, the throttles don't get, don't get stuck. And right. also, the box is idle, Whatever tenant is doing work it gets to do maximal work. Right. So the, the, you only get throttled back in, in, in the presence of contention, which is very important when you've got something that's as underperforming as disks are. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, you don't want to throw. You don't want to. You want to take the number of random reads in the box and chunk it up by the number of tenants because everyone would have a quarter of a read per second. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I think we should. Probably move on. <laughs>